do I really believe this word? The idea that all you need to do is make a decision, pray a prayer, sign a card, become a Christian, and keep your life as you know it. It's not true. You become a follower of Jesus and you lose your life as you know it. New Testament Christianity is a narrow road that's not easy. It's a costly road of continual obedience. And I want to urge you to take that path. God clothes every single Christian with the power of His Spirit so that every single Christian might lead people to Christ. I want to ask, will you obey God's will for your life? No matter what it is. Let's believe this word, even when it stretches us, and then let's proclaim this word, even when it costs us, because this is what it means to be a follower of Jesus. Good to see you. Um, I'm without my pulpit up here. I feel a little awkward, but they're taking care of it, so just hang with me a second. Uh, it's good to be back. Penny and I were traveling last week. We were in uh, upstate central New York, and, uh, and uh, it was an interesting thing. We're, we're in the middle of a series here called Follow Me, uh, and we're, the session we're going to talk about today has to do with the church. And it's not just try a church. We're a good church. We're not the only good church. We're not, uh, we're not the only expression of the church around and I was in a church very much different than ours uh, last week it was much smaller and um, you know they're Yankees or whatever so it was a, uh, but the interesting thing thank you guys I appreciate it uh, the interesting thing is that uh, I had never met any of them except my brother and his wife of course but I'd never met anybody there before last week and yet we had a bond that was real we had it because of Christ who lives within us and the church is when we talk about the church today, we'll be primarily talking about the universal church, not universalist church, but the, the church everywhere. You know, all true believers in Christ make up uh, the whole church. And we're going to be talking about that and how it's important that we uh, that we see that. I'm not going to preach before we pray, but just want to say that it's important we see it, how much that means to Christ. You know why? Because that's his wife. You want to you want to get on my good side? Say good thing about my wife. Yeah, you and I'll be buds. <laughs> she is pretty. Is she? <laughs> Talk good about my wife. You know, we're on, on a good start anyway. You might be able to overcome that. We'll be good friends if you'll just hang in there with that. The same is true about Jesus. And it's so easy for us to see the flaws in the church, isn't it? Can I tell you God's doing something really good here? Amen. He is. I, you may or may not even be aware of that. The victories that are being won, the lives that are being changed, the great things that are happening Amen. here. I marvel sometimes that God is doing that in spite of us. Okay? And through us. And in us. He's doing that and He wants to do more. Amen. We cannot plumb the depths of His goodness and the, the breadth of His enormous workings. We're seeing uh, people's lives change, their, their children getting saved, their marriages being restored, their, their attention to, to the Lord being increased. We're seeing this, y'all. Maybe you're seeing it, maybe you're not, but if you're not yet, you will be because it's what's happening here. And we're going to talk about that just a little bit. And I just got excited, so I thought I'd say all that. Join me in prayer if you would. I really like to start that way because it helps me. So if you would pray with me. Thank you, Lord, for your goodness. Thank you, Lord, that you have established that you will work through your people in this world. We know of your greatness. We know that you could move without us. You have no need of us, but your desire is to move in us, and we thank you for that. We thank you that your love for us is unending, that your ways are beyond finding out completely. And yet, Lord, as we even scratch the surface of your ways, we marvel at your wisdom. Come now, speak this morning, if you would, even through me. Lord, you can take uh, my sack lunch, as it were, and you can break it and feed everybody. And I ask that you do that in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, uh, I want to start by reading a scripture, but before I do, let me just say, I listened to last week's service, and you guys did a great job. Amen. I, really it. I, have said, I have said for a long time that it is a, a part of 
what is going on in our church, that we get a front row seat to see people's lives being changed in Pierce Ministries. And that's a blessing to us individually and to us corporately. So I thank you for what you're doing. All of you guys and girls, I appreciate you. Um, keep doing the good work. Keep fighting the good fight. Don't grow weary and well-doing. For you do time, you will reap if you faint not. That's what the scripture says. So thanks for, for doing such a great job last week. I appreciate it and I enjoyed listening to it. All right, let's read a, a scripture in Romans and then we'll, we'll talk about it a little bit. Uh, Romans 12, beginning in verse 3, says, For I say, through the grace given to me, to everyone who is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly, as God has dealt to each one a measure of faith. For as we have many members in one body, but all the members do not have the same function, so we, being many, are one body in Christ and individually members of one another. Having then gifts, differing according to the grace that is given to us, let us use them. If prophecy, let us prophesy in proportion to our faith. Or ministry, some uh, translations make that service, let us use it in our ministering or our serving. He who teaches in teaching, he who exhorts in exhortation, he who gives with liberality, he who leads or administers with diligence, and he who shows mercy with cheerfulness. There's, there are two uh, warnings, as it were, in that scripture. One uh, stated plainly and the other just implied. And the first one is that we not think too highly of ourselves. That's stated clearly there. And then implied is that we also not think too poorly of one another. That, and, and I'm going to show you how that comes out in that passage in just a minute. But let's, let's begin by looking at ourselves if we not think too highly of ourselves. You know, we all tend to be that way. We think that the way, however God has gifted us, whatever perspective we have on things, it's the right perspective and everybody else ought to agree with us. We just think that way. Can I tell you that's not really the way God wants us to think. He wants us to appreciate the differences in our brothers and sisters. Different perspectives, different insights and all that. And I think that's what this is, is talking about. So, so let's look at what he says here. I think he gives us these seven giftings. And let me tell you what I, what I think this is. Uh, and, and a little bit of this I'm forming out of the context there, so, so hold with me there. I believe that each one of us is given one of these basic grace gifts that is the paradigm through which we observe everything. And it's different from what others hold. Now, I can't prove that you only have one of these. What I can prove is that you don't have all of these. Because it says we have gifts differing from one another. If we all had all of them, we'd all be the same. <laughs> Okay. He also said in that passage I just read that it's given to each one of us a measure of faith. I think that's singular. And then it said then we have gifts differing from one another. So I think we have it one. I think that as I go through it, it will be hopefully clear to you that that's the case. But we need to describe what each one of these are. First off, the first one mentions prophecy. Let me tell you what that does mean. That does, if you've got the gift of prophecy as talked about in this, it's not saying that you can tell the future. That's not what it's talking about here. There are, and I should lay the groundwork of a broader discussion of spiritual gifts to make sure we know what we're talking about here today. Most people who talk about uh, spiritual gifts, they take four different lists in the New Testament that we'll look at in a minute. Um, and they, they try to lump them all together, like each one's a, a sort of part of the list. Like God just didn't figure out how to say the whole list at one time. Now God's saying it in all four cases, and he's doing it through the Apostle Paul in all four cases. So you would think that each list would be sufficient for, it, for itself. Why did he make different ones? And prophecies in all four of them. So it gets confusing sometimes when you try to force them to be one grouping. It's not one grouping, y'all. Each list has its own discussion. And I'd like to put that, uh, those four scriptures up there on, on the board. I'm not going to teach the whole thing today, but I'm going to teach the first one. Uh, we'll do the others in a series some other time. But I want to teach the one out of Romans because that applies to the church and, and how we function. Uh, but the four lists are these. first one's found in Romans chapter 12, the one we just read. And then I will call those the grace gifts. And I'll explain why I'm calling that in, uh, that in just a few minutes. Uh, the second listing is in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, the beginning of the chapter, and it's called the manifestations of the Spirit. Manifestations of the Spirit is just the Spirit of God showing up and doing what He does. Yes. He does it whenever He wants, 
through whomever he wants. It's not a resident gift that you have all the time. It's just an expression of the Spirit of God being born out in you. That's what a manifestation of the Spirit is. There's a list there, and sometime way off in the future or wherever we'll, we'll get into that in more detail. The third list is in, later in the same chapter, 1 Corinthians chapter 12, and it's a list of ministries. Okay, and it's the things that you do with it. You can have any of these grace gifts and any of the manifestations may show up at times in your life and you may be plugged into a specific ministry that's listed there. And the fourth list is in Ephesians chapter 4 and that's the offices in the church, sometimes called the five-fold ministry of the church, the apostles, the prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers. These are four completely separate subjects. They're not all discussing the same thing. And so I wanted, I wanted to make that clear so that as I go through this discussion of of Romans chapter 12 you can see that this is talking about a gifting that is in you that's resident in you that is permanent in you and it informs your view of everything the problem that we run into is we don't always appreciate that in someone else or we think that our way of viewing it is the ultimate way of viewing it it's not y'all we're all just a part of it and God designed us to function like a body where each part's necessary, and your part's necessary, and my part's necessary, and they're different. Okay? I'm a teacher. That's what God gifted me to do. That's what He put inside me. It's what motivates me. It's what, what uh, it, it's the way I look at things. And so we'll, we'll see all of those. So let's take them in order, if we could, here. First is uh, prophecy. It says here that we all have, have been given gifts. The uh, Greek word for gifts there is charisma. That's what it is. We use it. To, we use that word in our own thing. That person is a has a charismatic personality. Sometimes used to refer to certain types of churches or different doctrines and so on. But it's the word here for gifts is charisma, and it's differing according to the grace given to us. And the word for grace is charis, C H A R S. It is the root word of charisma. So then, the gifts given here are grace gifts. It's what the word means. And it's, the, it's by the grace of God He has instilled in you and in me a gift. First, let's talk about prophecy. What is prophecy as a grace gift? Prophecy is um, it's the desire to see everyone adhere to the righteous standard of God. That's all that means as a grace gift in you. You may have the gift of prophecy and what motivates you as a Christian, what, what colors what you look at is that you see everything in black and white. There's no gray in between. You know those people. They're really straight down the line. Don't say that. That's out of whack. Whatever. And these people are important to the body of Christ. I'm married to a person like that. I need that sometimes. All the time, probably. But this person doesn't have much compassion sometimes because the righteous standard of God is the righteous standard of God. We must adhere to that. And if we don't have people pushing us as the body, in the body, if we don't have people pushing us to stay on that road, some of us would just kind of mosey on off the path. That's how we are. Now we have other strengths, but those people are important to us. I'm not saying they're a prophet. They don't have the office of a prophet. They don't have the ministry of a prophet. They're not prophesying as a manifestation of the Spirit. What I'm saying is as a grace gift and a perspective they have, sometimes called a motivational gift, meaning it's the gift that is how they're motivated, is they expect to see the righteous standard of God adhered to. Okay? Everybody know somebody like that? We need them. Second one is serving. Also called ministry in the way I read it, but I like it stated as serving. Uh, it's the same, same meaning. They desire to serve God through meeting practical needs of other people. You ever know somebody like that? I love them. They're the ones that have everything fixed up before we get here. Thank you, Larry. Thank you, Chris. I got here this morning. Chris was already setting stuff up. That's great service. Now, we can learn to do all these things, but there are certain people that their motivation in life is to take care of other people's needs. It's just what they do naturally. I think back to a time when we were in Florida. I was about 23, 24 years old, something like that. Just started teaching adult Sunday school way back in my young days. And uh, one of the other teachers, I went to a great big, you know, 5,000 member church, so the big church. And uh, um, so the young adults, which were in their 20s, was one department that was pretty big, had several teachers when we broke up into class. One of the other teachers had a wife. Well, all the other teachers had a wife, but this one in particular had a wife. Her name was Patty, just like my wife's name's Patty. And this other Patty, she was wonderful at taking care of things. She was just always watching out for other people. You know what? She never talked about Jesus. 
Not much. She never talked about what she'd learned in, in her Bible study that morning. You know, that aggravated my wife. She wondered if she was even saved. And we laugh about it now, but she actually did. She said, I think she's just a nice person. She may not even know Jesus. That is all over there. We're talking about Jesus. The girl was the same as any of us. She just had a different motivation. She just had a different perspective. And her perspective was Christ was expressed best, best by her when she took care of things for people. And she did. And she was wonderful person. And when we learned this, Patty and I learned this idea at the time that people were driven by different motivations, she developed a new appreciation for this lady and could understand that she was doing what God had created her to do. It's a great thing. If you have that gifting, thank you. Often these people just soon not be recognized. They don't care if somebody thanks them for what they do. They, they already got the reward because it's what motivates them from the very beginning. Third one is teaching. It's the desire to understand the deep truths of God and explain them to others. Now I understand this. This is who I am. Okay, this is what motivates me. I love to, I love for somebody to come and say, I got a question. Can you explain this to me in the Bible? That's like saying sick and feel a bad dog. I love it. I love it. Because that's what motivates me as a Christian is to get into the Word, see what it's saying. Truth is, I can just stay in my room and just do that for hours and be just fine. Daddy wouldn't like that, bro. That's what motivates me is, is to, to teach that and then be able to explain it uh, to others. Exhortation. It's the desire to encourage others to follow the Lord closely. Todd comes to mind when I think that. Pastor Todd comes to mind when I think that. How he loves to encourage people. And uh, I'm in that group of people, so I do appreciate that. Um, a person with the gift of exhortation has always come alongside encouraging you, you know, let's do this, this will get there. And we all exhort one another from time to time, but some people are just motivated to do that in their inner person. The next one is giving. That's the desire to meet the needs of others through the sharing of your resources. Uh, monetarily, generally speaking, maybe time, whatever it is, but it's giving as an expression of who uh, Christ is and, and what their role is. Administration, it, it says leading up there, but I think when we use the word leading, which is not what it means, we think of the person that's in charge. A person with the gift of administration isn't necessarily always in charge. They just, they're motivated by organizing things to make it run efficiently. That's what motivates them. That's what, that's what, um, uh, that's how they serve the Lord is by organizing things. And we sometimes don't appreciate those people enough. And most of the time we don't. We think they're in the way, but they're not. They're doing great work. We used to laugh when Charity was little and said she had the gift of administration because she bossed everybody around. But <laughs> I'm not sure if she still has that gift or not. We'll leave that for somebody else's judgment. <laughs> and the, the seventh one listed there is mercy. And mercy is a person who desires to empathize with the feelings of someone else. They feel what you feel. I can't even understand that person. Okay? I, I don't do that. I don't know how to read it. I'm not sure why that was so funny. But anyway, those of us who have different giftings, we don't necessarily identify with that other person. And yet, this person identifies with other people and their feelings. Okay? Let me give you an example that will illustrate this. Let's, let's imagine for a minute we're at a party and... and uh, somebody comes in with a tray of drinks, soft drinks, uh, on a tray uh, to, to give Cokes and Sprites and whatever around. As they come through the door, they trip and drop this whole platter of drinks and they go everywhere. The way that we respond will be somewhat of an indicator of what our gifting is. A person with the gift of prophecy would say, if you would not try to carry so many drinks at once... <laughs> You can probably make it in here and you just need to do better next time. <laughs> the person, uh, let's get them in order here. The person with the gift of serving says, here, let me help you get that up. And they start picking up pieces and straightening stuff up. The person with the gift of teaching said, well, I really perceive that the problem is that you had them a little bit weighted to one side and the threshold of the door was a little high. And once we take care of that, everything will be fine. Okay? The person with the gift of exhortation says, I remember a time when I made a mess at a party, dropped a bunch of stuff. You know, I survived it. Chin of a big guy won't make it. Okay? The person with the uh, gift of administration says, you get a broom, you get a mop, you get a... Uh, a new set of drinks, whatever. They just organize everything in a hurry and get it done. The person with the gift of mercy puts their arm around. Says, it's all right, honey. It could happen to anybody. You're doing fine. 
and they, they uh, uh, empathize with the person with giving says, here's 20 bucks, somebody go get some more drinks. <laughs> we all have a different perspective, and that perspective drives how we serve the Lord. Now, in this passage, in Romans, I think the next seven verses give, in order, an instruction, a further clarification for these seven giftings. So let's read those together and think about that. Let's think about the person with the gift of prophecy. And uh, that desires to see the righteous standard of God adhered to. Here's the instruction that comes to him. Well, let me just read the instruction and then we'll go back and look at it. Verses 9 through 15 says, Let love be without hypocrisy. Abhor what is evil, cling to what is good. Be kindly affectionate to one another with brotherly love, in honor, giving preference to one another. Not lagging in diligence, fervent in spirit, serving the Lord. Rejoicing in hope, patient in tribulation, continuing steadfastly in prayer, distributing to the needs of the saints, given to hospitality. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse. Rejoice with those who rejoice and weep with those who weep. Let's take them in order. First, uh, verse 9 relates to the person who has the uh, grace gift of prophecy person who wants to see everything done and see it black and white and you can learn you can learn to be merciful and kind in that my wife has learned that but it took a little growing up for her to get there frankly she would tell you that as well and so it says here let love be without hypocrisy in other words don't just fake it like you love somebody because you're really mad because they won't act right love has to overcome that the love of God must compel us okay but it says he doesn't say don't be that way as far as seeing things from God's perspective. Abhor what's evil and cling to what's good. So the perspective is all right. The application of it needs to be with grace. That's why it's a grace gift. Everybody follow? Yes. And lost you yet have yes. Servant. Verse uh, 10 there. Be kindly affectionate to one another with brotherly love and honor giving preference to one another. Okay? Serving one another. Doing what it is that God's created you to do. Do it with love and give preference to other people. So it's encouraging them to be who it is um, that he designed them to be. Here's one that I have to I have to refer to often for myself. Teaching, not lagging in diligence, fervent in spirit, serving the Lord. Let me tell, I can tell you what a teacher's weakness is. For me, a person who has this motivational gift of teaching, it's easy for me to just keep back, just read, just enjoy life, and don't do anything with it. That's easy enough to do. To me, that's self-fulfilling. I, I get all right with it. He says here, don't do that. Don't lag in diligence. There's a reason for you to study this stuff so that you can um, bless others with it. And um, uh, fervent in spirit. What good is it if you know everything, can't apply it, don't use it, can't uh, teach it, and serving the Lord with that? The teacher has to stay motivated to apply that, or he just gets inward focused and is a bum. <laughs> I can relate to that sometimes. Uh, exhortation. Um, rejoicing in hope, patient in tribulation, continuing steadfastly in prayer. A person who's an encourager, who's an exhorter. It's easy for them to encourage you, but when you drop the ball, they're ready to give up on you sometimes. It's difficult to stay, uh, to stay focused on, in that. And yet that's the instruction given to us here. Rejoicing in hope. That's the easy part for the exhorter. Patient in tribulation. And continuing steadfastly in prayer. Here's where the, here's where the weakness is for the exhorter. Sometimes they, they just are so natural in their exhortation that they don't pray about what they ought to do. Sometimes they need to be quiet and let God do what He's doing. Okay? So we have, to, we have to hear God in the application of what we're doing. Okay? Giving. Uh, distributing to the needs of the saints and giving to hospitality. A ten spot doesn't always take care of it. Sometimes it takes your personal touch, your personal um, your person. It, it has got to have skin on to do it sometimes. Money, money doesn't do it by itself. So it's saying that. Um, and it says distribute to the needs of the saints. Um, which they did in the first century, if you recall. They took care of each other, and so we should. Administration. It's interesting, this uh, instruction. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse. You know why it says that? Nobody likes the administrator. <laughs> well, some people do. But it's easy not to. Because they're telling us what we just need to do. That's so boring. That's so intrusive. But can I tell you, God says it's a gift. That's right. And he says we all recognize it and not think too poorly of it for it. So what the instruction to the person with the gift of administration is, bless those who curse you. Bless and don't curse. Have good attitude in it. Keep putting together the, the schedule that people keep wrecking and whatever. 
mercy. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Weep with those who weep. Empathize with whoever, however, because God's given you a gift in to do that. Now, I say all that to say we need to operate within God, what God has made us to be. Within who God has made us to be. Each of us does. And we need to appreciate that. Patty and I really grew in our relationship when I could appreciate that God made her hardcore and she could appreciate that He made me laid back. We got along better after that. And we got along okay before that. But it was better after that because we appreciated each other's gifting. The truth is, I need a wife who motivates me sometimes. You know, get up off whatever and let's get after it. And she is that way. Our whole life she's been pushing, pushing, pulling. And I've been saying, whoa, hold back a little bit. She needed me to hold, pull the reins back. I needed her to be that. That's who we are in our house. And that works really well for us. You need to understand, or I hope you will understand, that in your house and in your relationships, there are people who are different from you, and that's for your good, not for your aggravation. God designed it that way. He intended for us to be different in this body. That's true in our house, but it's also true in this house. And it's true in the house bigger than that. It's okay that churches are different than us. It was all right last week. I enjoyed singing the old hymns. I still like them. Okay, now we don't do it here. They, they have a different expression there. But you know what? We were both worshiping the same Lord last week at the same time. In different parts of the country. Because God has designed us to be different and to benefit from that difference. Okay? What our problem, when our problems arise, they arise because we want people to view it just like us. We must get past that. We must. Or we will be restrained in our Christianity. We will be uh, just one piece of who we should be. Okay? Can we embrace that? Let me read another scripture to you. This is out of 1 Corinthians chapter 12. Say the same thing, and I'm going I'm to close after a brief discussion on this. Uh, the scripture says, If the foot, and I, I didn't write the whole thing on the board, I'm sorry, I was going to start later in the chapter, and I'll, I'll read the first few verses without you being able to see it, so just listen, and then what's on the board, we'll catch up to it in a minute. If the foot should say, Because I'm not a hand, I'm not of the body, is it therefore not of the body? And if the ear should say, because I'm not an eye, I'm not of the body, is it therefore not of the body? If the whole body were an eye, where would be the hearing? If the whole were hearing, where would be the smelling? But now God has set the members, each one of them in the body, just as He pleased. And if they are all one member, where would the body be? I thought about this as I was just reviewing it this morning. I should have dressed up in an outfit that looked like an arm. <laughs> I'd walk around your elbow sticking out over here, whatever. And we would all laugh because that doesn't look right. Neither does the body of Christ look right if we just look like one part. If we don't have the full expression. Now to the part that I actually have on the board. But now indeed there are many members yet one body. And if the eye and the eye cannot say to the hand, I have no need of you. Nor again the, eye, the head to the feet. You know what? If my eye itches, it counts on this hand. It just does. Now... My hand depends on the eye to tell it how to pick up this paper. So we're interdependent by God's design. I have what, the, nor again the head to the feet. I have no need of you. No, much rather those members of the body which seem to be weaker are necessary, and those members of the body which we think to be less honorable, on these we bestow greater honor. And our unpresentable parts have greater modesty, but our presentable parts have no need. But God composed the body, having given greater honor to that part which lacks it that there should be no schism in the body, but that the members should have the same care for one another. And if one member suffers, all the members suffer with it. And if one member is honored, all the members rejoice with it. Now you are the body of Christ and members individually. This doesn't do away with our individuality. What it says is that your individuality is a part of a greater body. And you have a responsibility to function that way. And you are not... You're not allowed by God, nor by anybody with the gift of prophecy, you're not allowed to disregard the other gifting. You understand? Yes. We can't do that. 
And yet we do that. Can we not embrace our differences? Can we not see that that's good? I, I remember a time I hurt my thumb. I, I was living in South Carolina and I, we had these old thorny trees I was trying to cut down around uh, an area of our property there. And I, I said, this would make a really cool crown of thorns. And so I was going to make just a crown of thorns out of it. And as I was bending that old, that old branch like that to do it, it popped back and one of those thorns stuck in my the knuckle of my thumb right by my hand. Okay? Well, I pulled it out. You know, it must have some kind of poison on it or something. For two years, that thumb didn't function right. Two years. Sometimes I couldn't even touch my palm with it. And do you know how much trouble that gave me? It was difficult to tie my shoes. It was difficult to do everything. That thumb's pretty doggone important. I never think about my thumb. For two years, I didn't think about much else except my thumb. Because <laughs> it aggravated me all the time. Okay? We understand this limitation in our own body when something goes wrong and we, and we can't have the use of some part of our body. We understand that. Can we not understand that in the body of Christ? That we are different and that's good, not bad. That's for our benefit, not for our aggravation. That's what he's calling us to today. So as, as we preach about following uh, the, the, the following Christ, follow me, and we talk about the church and our function, we are individually accountable to God, but we are part of a greater body. The band's going to come now. We're going to stand up in just a minute and worship the Lord. If, if you don't know Christ, if you are not in that body, then you are flailing around out there somewhere. Please come let me introduce you to Jesus this morning. I'd love to do that. Nothing will thrill me more. If you do know the Lord, but you, you need prayer on something, we'd love to pray with you. Or if you want to just come to the altar and, and pray. Uh, if you want to stay right where you are and pray, that's okay too. But seek the Lord. Ask Him, Lord, what have you caused me to be? in your body and how can I express that according to your will if you are at odds with somebody in the body please make up just go tell them you're sorry go ask them to forgive you they're not here do it this afternoon but, but make restitution because we are a body and we don't want to be fighting against ourselves we want to function as he designed us to function let's stand together let's worship the Lord if you need, uh, need to come pray uh, just help yourself to it Thank <laughs> you.
many of us have in our lives surrendered to many things. Lord, right now, we want to truly surrender to you. Lord, we ask you by your Holy Spirit to reveal to us areas in our lives that we haven't yet truly surrendered. Lord, we ask for all of you, but yet we hold on to some of us. Help us empty ourselves out Continue to have your 